So IPv4 address in a nutshell, an IP address is a unique address that identifies a device on the internet or a local network. I guess there will be no any confusion in this statement. So we have IPv4 addresses. Um, basically to identify uh, every host on our network. So this, this range or the, these three, uh, eight, or can say the eight, uh, 16 bits, just a minute, let me do it. One. So this portion identify your network ID And the last one will identify your host. Okay, I have mentioned here the street number versus house number analogy. So let's draw it and uh, then you have better understanding. We have two streets. I will do the different color for different speed. Okay. Then this street will have uh, the address. Let's suppose the street has the address 192.168.1.1. X. So this is the address of the street. And then this street must have some houses or homes. And let's say this house number is one, this house number is two, this one is three, and this one is four. So how you identify, Crystal, if I ask you, um, identify the street and this house number, how you can merge these two things to identify as one? I'm going to say 192.168.1.1. Yes. Dot dot yes. Two. Two, exactly. So this is the complete address of this, this thing. So combining our network ID plus the host will identify as it is mentioned as unique address. So this is going to be our unique address. And the similarly for the third or the for the third home, we can say it will be 192.168.1.3. And since these are all on the same street, they all can communicate with each other. On the other hand, we have another street. Let's say this one is 10.1.1.x. This is the name of the street or the address of the street. And then we have some homes. The same name that we are using here, one, two, three, and four. So again, just by combining street address along with the home number, you will get the one complete identification for one home. So similarly, whatever the uh, uh, these houses are connected with this street, they are going to communicate with each other. But Krista, can you tell me, can these two streets communicate or can these two networks communicate with each other? If I want to talk from this to this network, can they communicate or can they talk with each other? You will need to connect them, right? Okay. How? If, it, uh, if we are talking about networks, you're going to use a router because it's... Exactly. Yeah, this is the whole idea. So my analogy was we will 
create a kind of bridge here. Okay, mm-hmm. before there th- there was a disconnect. Now they have a bridge in between, and this bridge will be basically nothing a, uh, but a router. Or uh, a switch layer three. Yeah, layer three. Okay. Okay. So we have two different networks here, and we want to make communication between these two. So the only device that will help us doing communication is the router. With the help of router, we can make these two networks communicate with each other. So. uh let's discuss little bit more about the ipv4 addressing this is 32 bit and 4 byte address it is dotted decimal because we use these dotted in between at opposed to uh, the ipv4 we have ipv6 which use what crystal if you have any idea for the separation Double, uh, double colon. Yeah. Yes, it's colon. Sorry. No, no, it's a, just a colon. Okay. You're right. It's a colon. It has a network portion and the host portion. We have already uh, clear our concept using this analogy. Address values between zero to twenty two double five. This one thing is called octet. which means nothing but eight so we have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 range then 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and then so on for the other two so the range of these values will be for the digits will be from 0 to 2 5 you cannot go beyond like if you want to try uh, like adding here 256 it will not let you assign this ip with the dot 25 256 because the values are just from 0 to 255 then this is the binary number system it has network address broadcast address and the host address when we will hit the subnetting i will show you there what is network address what is broadcast address and what is host address so in short if i will give you uh, idea network address nothing just like a street street analogy we have done through and the host address is just the house number and what is broadcast broadcast uh, you are already familiar that if this host wants to communicate with another host it should be on the same subnet it will send the broadcast to everyone to get familiar that who else devices with the same subnet range exist on my local area network then subnetting labs we will do in the last so if if you have any confusion you can ask prisha any question okay, okay. i'm oh, good okay okay i'm right. okay so since we are talking about ipv4 we want to take a, a detail look of what is inside the ipv4 header with the help of vaisha so what is ipv4 header basically an ipv4 header is a prefix to an ip packet that contains information about the ip version length of the packet source and destination what does it mean it means of course this ipv4 is going to communicate with some another host 
or the server. So this IPv4 header, with the help of this IPv4 header, uh, we will know that this IP is heading toward where? What is the source IP? What is my destination IP? What kind of protocol I'm going to use? So these kind of information will be uh, having in the IPv4 header. So if I can show you. So this is the, uh, the look of IPv4 header packet, basically. It has so many things inside it, and we will cover one by one. The first thing is version. It has to do with what kind of IP version we are going to use, which will be IPv4. Then this will be the header length. Header length or can say internet header length. If you have gone through the OSLR model, I told you on every layer, you know, it is going to add one kind of, we have a data here. If I'm talking about the layer two, it is going to add ethernet header. So this is the thing. This is how we will know what kind of header it is going to attach. And the, another very simple analogy for IHL, if I can show you, we have this envelope. And inside the envelope, we know we have a letter. And sometimes it is mentioned on the envelope. This is the area you are going to tear or separate it. So you can take out the envelope. So this is the same concept with the I internet header land. It is going to mention what is the area for your header land. And then this is your data. Okay, usually this is 20 byte, but what if your uh, means data is more, then it needs to add more header length. So it could be like 30, 40, 60, it varies. And then we have some another concept like type of service. Um, you know, uh, you have in your host machine, let's suppose this is your host machine, and then it is connected with the router. But then in, on your host machine, you have multiple services. Let's say this is your voice over IP phone. Then you are surfing internet as well. And you know that voice over IP, you must need kind of more quality for the voice over IP and you want to process voice over IP first than your uh, web surfing because the voice over IP is very sensitive. So in IPv4 header, we're going to use these kind of things, type of service. This is also known as TOS. It is also known as quality of service. If we talk about the switches, uh, this is known as uh, just coming here. in switches, it is known as class of service. So the same thing has different names. When it hits switches, this is called class of service. When it hits router, it is known as type of service. 
or it is also known as DSCP, DSCP. I will show you in when I will give you a demo. So don't worry about this. Then this is the packet length. This is our basically the data. And size for this packet length is 65,536. Then we have these things, the identification flag and fragment of set. So just leave it alone. I'm going to discuss this later on. Once I will be finished with these things, because these are much more easier than this. Then we have time to live. If you familiar in a uh, trace, trace root command, we had this TTL. And Krista, can you tell me what is TTL? Time to leave. Yeah. What is the purpose of it? So it decrement, it decreases when you hmm. go from up to up. Yes. Oh. But uh, okay, that's fine. But what is the logic reason why we need this? Uh, okay. Yeah. Why do we use that? I think <laughs> it's for. <laughs> Oh my, it's for no counting. Problem. It's for counting the all. But what? Okay, that's fine. We are counting, but why? Really, I don't know. Okay, uh, one simple short answer is just to avoid loops. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Why? For example, I will show you. Uh, if we have multiple routers, let's go this one. Yeah, just uh, wanting to answer. Hi, for yeah, that's what it is, and that's he's gonna explain that. Um, that time to live because well, it, it needs to end sometime, right? So I think that's what he's going yeah. to say. Thank you. Hefa is with us? Oh, yeah, I... she's sending in the chat. Yeah, she just okay. came back. I'm, I'm looking that's at right. chat camera. Don't worry about it. Okay, that's fine. So we have one device here and we have another device here. Let's say this is source and this is destination. So my, my you know, intention is to send the packet from here all the way to my destination. So the possibility and the chances are maybe these things are broken somewhere. So the whole logic behind TTL is, uh, let's uh, take the example when we have everything working fine. So the TTL, um, as the, the crystal said that, that it will be increment, but it will be decrement first of all, because when the host machine is going to send the information, it will uh, add the TTL value, let's suppose 128, which means it can hop 128 total routers. Those will come in the path. So it can hop around 128 total routers and it can hit the destination. But in our case, we have only, let's say one, two, three, four, five. So we have 128 here, the TTL value, when it will hit this router, it will be 127. When this will hit this one, it will be 126, then 125 and then 124, that's it we have end-to-end -end communication and there is no any issues with the TTL. But let's say when we have a worst case, the TTL as it is, it's 128. But in between, in the router, somewhere in a service provider, they have some kind of flaws, some kind of glitch, some kind of issue with the router or with the configuration. Okay. So the TTL is 128 here. When it will hit here, it should be 127. But let's say, let's assume this is our service provider. Instead of going to the destination, it just sent the packet here. It will go there, it will become 126. It will come back again, it is 125. 
maybe it will go there it is 124 and it will just loop around and around until it will hit zero so at this time when it hit the zero the router is intelligent enough to know that this is the lost packet so it will discard that packet instead of spreading it spreading it or looping it around and around so that is the basic idea behind the time to live i hope you get my analogy now kamran maybe we can also add and and this is because of the router and switch smart capability right that's that was not the case before these devices right correct me yeah. if i'm wrong yes so if we talk about the switches uh the concept i think uh, you are going to learn in the next module this is called stp spanning key protocol that is also another mechanism for loop avoidance that's that's in addition to ttl yes okay the ttl is being used in the routing environment while uh, the STP is being used in the switching environment. All right, perfect. Okay. Then we have a protocol. And of course, when we are heading to some server, let's suppose we are heading to or going to the Google server from our host machine. This is the Google server. And we are going to hit some. Um, the web server of the Google, of course, we are going to use what kind of protocol? Can anyone tell me, please? HTTPS. Yes, it could be HTTP or HTTPS. Okay. Or it could be UDP or many other protocols we have around. So this um, field basically going to tell me that where I'm heading, which uh, protocol I'm going to hit. Then we have some header checksum. It is nothing just, you know, if, uh, if I give you a very lame an example, uh, you have this juicer blender, you take this all information and just put it inside the jar and just turn on the juicer blender. It will come up with some gibberish. When this gibberish or whatever the data this might be, when it will hit the destination server, it is going to check the header checksum. It will compare, it will also do some kind of reverse engineering to check whether whatever the header checksum, uh, you know, uh, what can say uh, the, the field or the conclusion of this header checksum is here, it is going to compare with the uh, source header checksum. So basically the destination is going to make a comparison with the source ch header checksum to make the comparison. So it know that this uh, IPv4 header is error free. So this is the basic idea behind the header checksum because we want to make the communication error free. So that is the reason we will use this header checksum there. Any confusion error? If you have any problem, you can ask, please. Good. You're clear? Okay. And these are very simple. Of course, we are using some source IP. This will be the source IP of your host machine and this is your destination ip let's say this is like uh, job skill share uh, ip which is public ip or the live ip and then we have some options these used for the security purpose or for stamping stamping purpose. So these are not being used. If I will show you uh, that at the wire shark, this is the structure of this packet, you will see there will be no any option. 
Then last but not least, these identification flag and fragment offset. If you have, if you have ever heard about the terms called MPU, anyone please? Yes. What is it? At least the abbreviation. Yeah, MTU. I know is the length of the packet. I exactly. U is yes. unit. Yes. This is maximum transmission unit. Let's suppose this is 1500 bytes. So this is the capability. Let if I give you example, we have two servers, uh, sorry, routers connected to each other. And in between, we have the switch. And this router wants to send some information to router two, but the MTU size here is 1500 bytes. But this is a switch which is not capable of this. Means he cannot handle such a big size of his packet. So let's say this is like 1400. So what is going to do? It will divide those all packets into small chunks, into the small pieces. Then it will send to the router two, And then router two when will receive, it will have some kind of, uh, uh, you know, the concept that now it is going to combine these all things back in the same format. Then we can have, this is just one flow I'm talking about, talking about. We could have thousand flows. Like what I'm talking, what I mean here flows, let's say this is your telnet session going on. This is your HTTP session going on. This is your HTTPS session going on. This is your voice over IP session going on. So how on earth is this router is going to collect these all information in a correct sequence. So that's why we use these fragment offsets values to identify what uh, the information belong to telnet packets, what information belongs to HTTP and what belongs to HTTP and so on. So these are the things we used when we have to do with the fragmentation. So flag is basically nothing, it's just zero or one. If it is one, it is saying that I'm going to fragment a packet. If it is zero, it is not fragmenting. I hope you get the point. So Kamran, just one question. And I always like to ask this type of question because, you know, what the my when I train a lot of people are beginners, right? And they have question in their mind is like, as an engineer, when do I break stuff like that in a real world environment? And like, what mm. would be an example of? Yes, one I know I need to learn. I need to learn yeah. IPv4 or packets in a deeper yes. way of understanding yeah. how it well, how the flow works. But when, as mm -hmm. an engineer, I really need to get in and say, okay, this is when you're really gonna need this information. Do you have any like a, an example, uh, just, just yeah. verbally, like okay. if you can give us some? So in a real uh, environment, uh, some network concept. This is called as DIP, DPI, sorry, which is stand for Deep Packet Inspection. Let's suppose we have a firewall inside. This is firewall. And there is some evil user who is using some kind of malicious activities. So with the help of deep packet inspection, we can identify using these IPv4 headers. Maybe he's playing with the packet length. Maybe he's playing with this fragmentation. Sometimes these known as, uh, you know, uh, if I'm not wrong, 
uh, overflow attacks buffer overflow buffer overflow attacks maybe he is playing with the ttl as i told you the ttl can be uh, this is very helpful but uh, and oppose this can also be very dangerous uh for uh, if if we want to generate some kind of looping inside its weak that 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 uh, uh evil user can play with the ttl and then he can for example source address he can spoof the source address as well means this is not a legitimate user but he is trying to spoof some other ip of some another user and is trying to play around or goof things up so with the help of deep packet inspection we can go in detail about these ipv4 headers and can take a look what is going on which i am going to show in a wire shark as well got it so so the the um, that answers my question for people that are listening um, yeah. this is where why you need to understand this type of knowledge in a deeper way because you will have to do uh, you know that type of analysis exactly. and you yeah. you can't do it if you don't understand what's inside these different type of you know ip headers uh, services and and every single thing has its own meaning and if you don't know that then of course as an engineer you're stuck basically you you can't you you won't be able to give a solution if it's that level of uh, you know that something is happening at that level and that's where yes you as a junior network engineer may not be doing that kind of deep stuff but you still need to understand it because that could be a project that you'll be give, working with another senior network engineers you still need to understand what they're talking to you what they're referring that reference is something is something that you should know as a, a junior network engineer as well uh, that's something you have to know this right am i correct kamar yes yes exactly also another thing this is also very helpful in the troubleshooting environment as well let's suppose we are having kind of looping in our environment and then we have to find out why it is looping so we can go a lot in detail using the wire chart and then we can go packet by packet to do analysis what is happening so this is also very essential we must have an idea what is happening what is going on inside the packet so i'm going to give you a demo about the ipv4 header whatever we have uh, learned in this uh, slide i'm going to show you in the wireshark 